Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 11th of August. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, the economic crisis is about more than your investments. And behind Combank's money laundering, banks are addicted to global drug profits. Craig, before we begin, I just want to make a comment about the North Korea issue, which is blowing up. It's, it's, it seems very terrifying at the moment. Um, the, the best thing to do is on the 7th of July, CEC report, we addressed the North Korea issue and we, we spoke about um, a proposal that could actually bring peace to that area. That right? report's on our website, Robin, I think. We'll it's on our website and it's on YouTube. So I urge viewers, look up the on YouTube, whether on YouTube or on the CEC website, the 7 July CEC report for an explanation of that. There's, there's, there's no, I don't have anything to add to it now, um, but that's what we need because there is a way to bring peace to there that doesn't involve going to war, which of course, and you've got to understand there are vested interests who, who love nothing more than going to war. So we need, we need a peaceful solution and we, we put it through on there. Um, so I'll just leave that at that. Let's start now on today's show. So the financial crisis is about more than your investments. And Craig, there's for the last number of weeks, actually, we've been on this theme a lot because, as we said in our um, alert service magazine this week, every new uh, uh, report that comes out about the property bubble in Australia is bad news. Right? There's it's, it's something new is coming out, you know, two or three times a week, sh showing signs that this thing is heading for a crash. Right? Um, so I'll just cite some of the latest ones. Mortgage delinquencies are up. Now, overall, the numbers are still um, relatively low. They haven't hit at one percent yet, but the rise is sharp. And you have um, mortgage insurers reporting this, and they're actually, they're actually announcing losses because they've suddenly had to start paying out more and more um, insurance claims on delinquent mortgages and bigger amounts of money as well. This is this is a phenomenon in Australia. We put out a press release on this this week that people can look at on our website. Um, the key thing about where these delinquencies are rising though, Craig, the fastest, it's in the areas where real unemployment is mm. shooting up. So it's in the mining areas of Queensland and Western Australia, but what really got my attention, it's in the manufacturing areas of Victoria, i.e. around Broad Meadows here where the Ford factory was shut down. And what people have to bear in mind is that um, that's one factory. We're gonna lose Holden and Toyota in October. Right, and there's many, many thousands more workers there, and it's almost by some reports it's 12 to one for the number of workers in the supply industry whose jobs are going to be lost for everyone in a factory. Right, mm -hmm. so this is and those people if they've got mortgages, they're not going to be able to pay them, and this is at record low rates. So this is a significant issue. Uh, the other question, the other thing that's come out is losses are mounting on house sales Australia wide. Now, it's something like 7% of people in Australia who sell their homes are currently selling at a loss, 7%. And I found that to be already quite high. In Western Australia, though, 20% of people who own, the home, own homes who are selling them at the moment are selling at a loss. 45% of investors in rural WA are selling their homes at a loss. And the, the biggest part of this is investors, actually. Australia-wide, it's a bigger percentage of selling at a loss than just homeowners. Investors are such a big part of the property market, Craig. They're only there for the capital gain. And if they have a sense they're not going to get capital gain, they're out of there. And that's the, that's the difference between homeowners, Robbie, actually owner occupiers, as opposed to the investors. They'll hang on forever, homeowners. Well, homeowners yeah. will fight to stay on and will spend as many of their last dollars as they possibly can to hang on. Whereas investors, as soon as they say there's nothing in this, they'll put the properties on the market. And when you have that as a phenomenon across the country, that's when the prices really rapidly start you to fall. You can get a stampede. Exactly, and, and, that, and I mean that's what we're heading towards, with, uh, you know, with the with the collapse of for the prices. I mean, you, you're seeing properties like in Broome and far Port Hedland that were selling for eight nine hundred thousand dollars three years ago, and now they can't get can't sell for three hundred thousand. Yeah, whole areas of the rural sector, like in Moranbah, Queensland, around the coal fields, you know, whole towns. As I think it was reported on sixty minutes, you know, properties that are basically unsaleable. And that's what happens when unemployment rises, right? Um, and that's why this unemployment question in Australia is a big deal because 
There's another report that's come out that we haven't reported anywhere yet. It'll be in our publication next week, which, which is very significant. BIS Oxford Economics is forecasting that in the next two or three years, construction in Australia will drop by one third. And they base that forecast on the fact that currently, Australia is, has been building more than 230,000 homes per year. However, the real demand for homes, i.e. the actual population increase, people wanting a home, is only about 184,000 homes per year. So we've been building at a rate far above the real demand, and that can't continue, they make the point. And so they're forecasting a one-third drop. But the problem is, Nick Craig, under the way our economy has been distorted, finance is the biggest sector of the Australian economy now. Construction is the second biggest sector. So when they say something like, oh, yeah, you're going to lose one-third of construction, that's a huge number of jobs that are going to be lost in construction. That's going to add to these car factory jobs and manufacturing, general manufacturing jobs that are going in the cities where... The bubble is. Also, Robbie, when you're talking about construction jobs, you're talking about electricians, plumbers, yep. carpenters, builders. So what happens is you have a flood of people coming in to that trade sector. So previously when you know tradies and so forth were earning reasonable incomes and sometimes high incomes, you're going to see many, many tradies now having to struggle to, uh, f to get yep. jobs, to get work. Yep. Now, across the general economy, not just in the uh, in construction industry. Because it it's like the mining bubble, like when it was high. It should never have been, construction should never have got this big. That's what a bubble does, it distorts the economy. So everyone piles into one area and all the people working there think, oh, this is, we're set. But if it's based on a bubble, you're not set and it mm. can just go like that. I can see, Robbie, I mean, you get about one fridge magnet a year in your ladder box for plumbers, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I can see we're getting about 10 very shortly yeah, because yeah, people yeah. are going to be seeking out that sort of work. Well, the, the they were previously uh, employed in the construction sector building new homes. I shouldn't laugh, but that was a funny way of putting it. We'll, put, we'll keep a fridge market measure of the economy, fridge, fridge magnet, magnet marker yeah, yeah. of the economy going. Yeah, the electricians, plumbers, you know, those sort of people. All right, so Craig, here's, but I want to talk about this slightly differently today than what we usually do because it's not, there's, a, there's a, something that viewers need to think about when it comes to the financial system. Just to make a point before we get there though, as we emphasise in our proposal for a Glass-Steagall separation of Australia's banking system that we have prepared for the Australian Parliament, and we'll talk about that more in a sec, the, 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 the equation is simple. When the property market goes, the property bubble goes, the banks go with it. It will smash Australia's banks because they are worse, they are more addicted to property than Ireland's were, than Spain's were, than Britain's were, than America's were. Our banks are more addicted and those banks in those countries were all smashed when their property bubbles burst. Ours is a goner. So that's what people have to understand. But what happens is when we warn people about this, the, 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 the first question naturally is, what can I do about my money? Right now, I, that's a natural question, and everyone would have that at the forefront of their mind. What can we do about our money? It misses a fundamental issue, though, that the, this crisis is more, it's not about investments. There's a financial crash that's going to come that's hurting your investments. The economic crisis is already here. Mm. And I'll give you an example high property prices. What's the problem with high property prices? Because they might crash? No, because they distort the economy already. People shouldn't pay this much for housing. Housing is shelter. It's a necessity. You've got to live in it. What's the problem? Our whole financial system, Craig, is geared to um, do things already that are just robbing people blind. It's looting people. We've got, we've got speculators in the energy markets, and consequently we pay sky-high energy. We've got governments that think their job is to provide infrastructure opportunities for investors instead of providing infrastructure for its own sake, right? And therefore we don't have enough infrastructure and our economy suffers as a result of that. We are already in an economic crisis. That's why a financial crash is gonna happen. Fixing this problem is about fundamentally fixing the economy. Um, so what would you like to say about that side of it? Well, Robbie, I think uh, King O'Malley, the founder of the Commonwealth Bank, uh, the original Commonwealth Bank, not this thing yep. that we've got now, he used to refer to this idea of fog wealth, right? And, and I'll quote what he said as a, as a counterposition to this. He said, permanent wealth is produced by the slow process of industry combined with skill and manipulation of capital. Fog wealth 
is produced by the rapid process of placing one piece of paper in the possession of a bank as a collateral security for two more pieces of paper. Some of the enormous quantity of fog wealth which is being created will sooner or later collapse. So this is what he was talking about, yeah. and this is about 1905, before he established, established the Commonwealth Bank. He was talking about this. But what we've got today is exactly the same thing. If you have a banking system like we are proposing around a glass steagall or reorganisation, which is what that proposal is about that you've held up before, then you separate out the necessary legitimate commercial banking system that does the boring banking, lends to uh, industry, lends to uh, households in the form of mortgages, takes in deposits, but it's very protected, it's all protected by the government so that the, the merchant banking and the investment banking side of the banking system, which has taken over everything now like a giant yeah. octopus sticking its fangs into your deposits, um, it's separated out. It's completely separated. It's yeah, protected. So, so when you have Glass-Steagall, what I think a lot of people hear when we talk about Glass-Steagall is this firewall part of it. Mm. Oh, yes, that will protect my deposits. And it will. Of course it will. It will. But it's much more than that. What else does Glass-Steagall do for the economy other than just protecting deposits? Well, it directs the credit into the productive side. And this is where you've had this enormous sucking sound in the last 30, 40 years of all the credit being sucked into this fog wealth. Yeah. Well, that credit gets put back into necessary uh, real actions in the economy, manufacturing, right? The, 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 the aspects of the, the real economy, like infrastructure, that produce an economy. That agriculture. Make, uh, agriculture, that, 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 that create the basis to which you can employ people. So, I mean, you said before that the financial industry is the biggest employer and the biggest sector in the economy now. Well, that's all fog wealth. It is. You know what happens with fog? Yeah. By lunchtime, it gets burnt off, right? Well, that's what's happening with the, the reality of the global financial crisis, which has never been solved. Yeah. It's going to get burnt, burnt yeah. off. All right. So, Craig, let's just, before we finish this sec uh, segment, we have made huge progress in the last couple of weeks. If regular viewers will recognise this document that we've been encouraging people to call in and get. So what we've, the plan has been to get this to every member of parliament. This was written for the parliament. They are the people... They're now who are in charge of the system when it crashes. So they better know what to do. So we have been getting supporters to take this to their local federal MP or mail it in with a letter, etc. Right? And we've almost got all members of parliament covered, but that's not good enough. We want we we have to cover every single member of parliament, and a bunch of them, as many as possible, cover multiple times. Right? So that they get the point that there are concern, concerned citizens out there who are concerned about more than, dare I say it, gay marriage, um, but potholes in the roads or you know, any number of issues that they probably normally get lobbied about. They're concerned about a fundamental issue of economic reform that would surprise many members of parliament if people even know about it. Mm. Right? If, so to the viewer, this is really racing ahead now, but the, um, uh, the more the merrier. Right, we really need you to get involved. So call in, get a copy of the alert service uh, for free, the, our weekly publication, but also this, order your own copies to get to your Member of Parliament. And then when you do, call us back to tell them, tell us the response you get, mm -hmm. right, so that we can, we can track that. But that's re really, really important. Don't just use the CEC as an information source. Get involved. Um, let's take a break now. We'll, when we come back, we'll talk about the Commonwealth Bank's money laundering. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Behind ComBank's money laundering, banks are addicted to global drug profits. So Craig, the big breaking story actually which broke a week ago mm -hmm. um, is Commonwealth Bank and this money laundering scandal. Austrack is called the Australian Transaction Report and Analysis Centre. It tracked the fact that this bank, the biggest in Australia, has committed 53,700 instances of serious and systemic non-compliance with anti-monetary money laundering laws. Um, literally thousands of transactions through these um, intelligent deposit machines, right? So this is all great technology, you know, it's all, the it's all the robot stuff. The human beings don't have to be involved. Well, now you see a bit of a vested interest why these banks might not want human beings involved because they could play plausible denial Gangsters would rock up to their ATMs, chuck in a water cash. Within seconds, it's deposited in bank accounts around the world, right? And voila, it's clean. And under Australian law, every every such deposit over ten thousand dollars has to be um, reported. Mm. 
Commonwealth Bank either wasn't reporting it or reporting it too late for the authorities to actually do anything about it. And what they know, there was literally thousands, I think there's something like $10 billion in total went through the machines this way before Commonwealth Bank put in proper processes that satisfied us track. But of these transactions, 1,640 were connected to um, money laundering syndicates, right? That people, that the authorities knew were money laundering syndicates doing this. And by the way, the authorities that knew it warned the Commonwealth Bank it was happening, and they and the Commonwealth Bank ignored the warnings. So we're supposed to believe that this somehow was a mistake. It was just a yeah. fault in the machine that this, this, they didn't realise this was going on. That's the nothing to see here. Sorry, nothing to that, see here. That's the uh, you know the, the narrative that we're getting from yeah. the banks that they're innocent of this because there's enormous fines in, attached to this. Isn't yeah. There? Well, look, we'll get to that at the end. Uh, so 1,640 were those. Six of the transactions, and this got a lot of attention, related to customers the bank itself had identified were ha as having links to terrorism or terrorism financing. Six of those transactions. So this, this really stinks. Now, the case is similar to HSBC, the giant British bank that the US Congress caught in um, 2011. They were, they were laundering Mexican drug cartel money and Saudi-connected terrorist money, right? Um, this led to one of the biggest scandals since the financial crisis because when HSBC, the Congress wanted to prosecute HSBC, the British government's um, Chancellor, George Osborne, lobbied the US Federal Reserve and the US Attorney General saying, no, 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 you can't do it because it could, if this crashes, HSBC could bring down the global financial system. And, the, and Obama's Attorney General said, okay, no, we won't do it um, because, yeah, that's a risk. And people said, well, so the banks are not just too big to fail, they're too big to jail. Right, and of course they got so they got a fine of a billion dollars or whatever. But for HSBC, it's so big, it, you know, that was um, nothing. Um, now, there's a bigger issue here though, and th that's what we want to talk about today. HSBC is only is one of many banks at the time, Craig, that were caught and doing this money laundering. Now, one of them was Wachovia, an American bank, but the rest were mainly British, including Standard and Chartered and Coots. Now, Coots is the banker to the Queen. And they even have ATMs in the Queen's, in Buckingham Palace, right? Um, why this is more than just, you know, low-level petty stuff was revealed in two, by, by, by two sources. One was in 2011, Russia's drug czar. Now, Russia um, hates, the Russian government hates drugs. 100,000 Russians die of drug overdoses a year. And they appointed this former general, Viktor Ivanov, as their drug czar to lead their war on drugs. And unlike America's war on drugs, which was bogus, and if I've got time, I'll, mention, I'll give you some of that. Unlike that, Russia, this, this guy, Ivanov, is very serious. So he goes to Washington in November 2011, gives a speech. And in that speech, he lays out the fact that the reason this is such an issue is because drugs are the biggest part of the, like, drugs rank alongside oil and gas in terms of size of monetary size in the economy. That's how big drugs is. Mm. And the banks, the whole banking system is addicted to this money that comes from drugs. So let's take a break. Now after the break, I'll go through the details of what he talked about. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where we're discussing behind ComBank's money laundering, banks are addicted to global drug profits. And before the break, Craig, I was telling about this speech that Russia's drug czar gave in Washington in 2011 about the way the global banking system is addicted to the money that comes from the drug trade because the drug trade is ranks alongside oil and gas as the biggest trades in the world, a real trade. And he, he, he cited certain things. So in the, the uh, uh, Antonio Costa, the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations Organization and the Executive Director of the Office of Drugs and Crime at the UN, he revealed that in the 2008-2009 financial crisis, when, uh, when the American banking system lost a trillion dollars from bad assets, right, the, for their speculation, vaporizing, um, global drug cartels injected 352 billion narco dollars into the ma world's major banks for extra liquidity. Mm -hmm. The global drug trade came to the rescue of the banks. This is, this is what the UN talked about. So um, 
Ivanov went through some facts about the financial system that we always say. So he goes through, we'll put these on the screen. These were the slides he had in his presentation. Figure two shows the, he calls it the financial soap bubble and the shaded pie piece there is the actual secured assets of 60 trillion only mm. from total assets of 600 trillion. So the rest of those assets are just fake. It's just a bubble, right? And then figure three, is how the financial soap bubble smothers the real economy. And then he breaks it down even further in figure four. The real economy is so dependent on things like military expenses because a lot of the governments should, you know, under Thatcherism, governments stop spending money on things except the military, mm -hmm. right? So real money is being spent on military, so the real economy becomes dependent on that. And criminal money, 50% is dependent on drugs, right? This is his point. And so therefore you've got a problem. If the banking system is, you know, so all important to the world and it's so dependent on drugs, you're not going to have a real war on drugs. He wasn't the first person to say this. We were. And by we, collectively, I mean our international association that is um, founded by the American economist Lyndon LaRouche. And in 1978, Lyndon LaRouche put out a book through his Executive Intelligence Review magazine from a massive investigation that the EIR staff had done called Dope Incorporated. And what that book went through then in 1978 was they just they just exposed the infrastructure of drug, the drug trade in, as of then, and they did a few updates to that book and you know pre previewed what Ivanov was on about. Um, but how this has always been part of the infrastructure of the British financial system, going back more than a century to the opium wars. HSBC, for instance, as a bank, came out of those opium wars, right? The drug trade was always central to the British, British business model. And in the city of London, you have this ancient system where the actual city of London, where the banks are based, is protected from normal laws. That's one of the reasons they can get away with this uh, to this day, even though drugs are illegal now. And the city of London controls the world's offshore tax havens, which is where a lot of drug money laundering is done through as well, right? And LaRouche said at the time, if you're going to have a real war on drugs, there's two things to do. You got to you got to go up. Don't don't go and arrest a bunch of marijuana smokers. That's not a war on drugs. A real war on drugs is crack down on the money laundering, without which the drug trade couldn't exist. So go after the banks for one, and two, do deals with governments to eradicate these crops. Um, for that, for saying that, Larouche's enemies attacked him and said, "Oh, because he you know, he's talking about how it's part of the British system under these ancient structures with the Queen on top." Oh, LaRouche says the Queen pushes drugs. That's what they tried to ridicule that claim to. No, well, since then, that's not what LaRouche said. He's talking about the system. Um, he later said, oh, I wish I had said it, right? But he hadn't said it. He's talking about the system. And since then, long after 1978, all these revel revelations have come out, how much the, the, the financial system is dependent on it. And a bunch of British banks were caught doing the actual money laundering that we always said they were doing. Mm. Um, so just to come back to... Commonwealth Bank, right, now it's on our shores. We're seeing this happening itself. And that's why we do not think this is a mistake at all. Craig, one humorous thing about Commonwealth Bank is if they had to pay the fines, it's $18 million per offence. There's 53,700 offences, and that adds up to $960 plus billion. They couldn't do it. To do it, if they did get fined that level, they'd have to be nationalised. But then I thought... Isn't that a good idea then? Let's, 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 turn it, let's turn it back to what it was actually in the beginning. And then, look, Robbie, you're not going to have to take on the drug cartels and their money laundering without having an alternative economic system, which means Glass-Steagall, national banking, credit issues through thing, something like the Commonwealth Bank and then large-scale infrastructure development. And incidentally, Victor Ivanov in his speech in 2011 said that same thing. We need a Glass-Steagall system. Call in for the Australian Alert Service where we'll lay this information out in that next week. But... Thanks, Craig. You're welcome. Run out of time. Thanks for tuning into the CSE Report and see you next week.